Good day, everyone. So today we're going to go over section 11.4. And notice my title here. We're still comparing two population means. But in the previous section, we studied where the samples were dependent. Now the samples are going to be independent. No pairing going on whatsoever. All right. But we're still looking at two population means. All right. Suppose we are interested in the difference between the mean price of a house in neighborhood one and neighborhood two. Suppose we want to decide whether the mean home prices are different by location. It seems reasonable. So we have our two populations. Now, I'll, I'll just let you know this, is that when you do a paired t-test or a two-sample t-test, or really, if you're looking at any uh, multiple populations, it really doesn't matter what you call population one, population two, all right? So, um, so right now, we're calling neighborhood one, population one, neighborhood two, population number two. Well, you could flip those, and it doesn't matter. You're going to get the same answer, right? Now, if I define something in WebAssign or in a test as population one, leave it, okay? But if you're doing this for a real study, it doesn't matter which one you call population one or population number two. All right, the following denotes the means of the variable house price for the two populations. Okay, so notice, let me get my pen out here, that we're talking about means of populations. So that must mean mu somehow, right? And we have two separate ones. So we have mu one, so that's the population mean from uh, neighborhood one, and then mu sub two, population mean from the second neighborhood, population number two, all right? All right, so a confidence interval can be calculated out by doing the following. We can independently and randomly take a sample of prices in neighborhood one and neighborhood two from the two populations, right? And so we're gonna take samples from each one of them, all right? Then we'll go ahead and compute X bar one, which would be the mean house price from the sample of houses selected in neighborhood one, meaning the sample mean from the first group, X bar, right? Sample mean X bar, just that is from the first population one. And then do exactly the same thing and call that X bar two from population number two. So we'll take a sample from population number two. All right, calculate the mean of those houses and call it X bar two. So the idea then is to go ahead and compare X bar one and X bar two. And how are we gonna compare? We're gonna do the subtraction between the two. So that's gonna be a good starting point, okay? That's a good starting point in comparing mu one versus mu two, uh, mu sub one versus mu sub two, all right? Is to compare, well, X bar one and X bar two, all right? All right, so now to make an inference about the difference between population means, meaning mu1 minus mu2, we need to learn about the sampling distribution of x bar 1 minus x bar 2. That will be the statistic in this section. What's going to be the parameter? mu1 minus mu2. So we don't have two parameters. We don't have two statistics. We actually have one parameter, mu1 minus mu2. And we have one statistic, x bar 1 minus x bar 2. It's kind of interesting. So the difference of x bar one minus x bar two is obtained from sample data. It will vary from sample to sample. This variation is the standard error of the sampling distribution of x bar one minus x bar two. Okay, and that's that. Okay, so there's uh, the standard error of x bar one minus x bar two. All right, and I got a question for you. Will will be where will the uh, sampling distribution of x bar 1 minus x bar 2 be centered? The answer is mu1 minus mu2. So if you haven't quite figured it out, okay, let me uh, kind of point it out to you. When we talk about the sampling distribution of x bar, you remember what was at the center of that? It's mu. So notice that for a sampling distribution, okay, um, that generally speaking, the parameter, the parameter that you are trying to estimate is going to be in the center. Remember for the sampling distribution of p hat? Here's the sampling distribution of p hat. What's at the center of the thing? The parameter that we're trying to estimate. Okay. And so the same thing is going on here. Where will the sampling distribution of x bar 1 minus x bar 2 be centered at? going to be centered at mu1 minus mu2, the corresponding parameter. So that's kind of interesting. 
Okay. So um, I want to show you something, and you really need to uh, kind of stick with this, all right? Because this really explains to you how sampling distributions work. Okay. Please try to follow this example as closely as you possibly can, because this really explains a lot about statistics. So I'm going to get out of here. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Excel. Because in Excel, I have a spreadsheet created. It's kind of an interesting spreadsheet. And what this is, is that I pretended to uh, create a, uh, a population here. Okay. And I'm going to call it just uh, X1. So this is population number one, if you will. And here's the raw data from population number one. Here's population number two. And here's the raw data from population number two. And I got to keep the numbers fairly low. I got to only keep it to 10 in each because if I make it much bigger, I wouldn't be able to calculate it. Be too many numbers to calculate it in Excel, right? Believe it or not. So what I have done here uh, is I'll go ahead. Actually, I'll, I'll I'll point this out to you right now. Is that um, the mean? So mu one, if you will. I've gone to high. I highlighted all the values over here. Down here, Excel will will calculate the average. And so you can think of 24, all right, as mu1. Here are all the values for population number two. What is mu2? 44, okay, 44. All right, now, here's where you gotta pay close attention to what's happening here, all right? So what I've done here is I've gone ahead and I have attempted and successfully attempted to create the sampling distribution of x bar one minus x bar two. And I want to show you how that would work. Okay, stick with this. All right. So what is this first number here? Well, think of it uh, that that is one possible x bar that you can get from uh, sampling three things from population number one. All right. So if uh, and so what that equals is that if you took the first three numbers, so if you just randomly took a sample of three things, the first possible sample that you can get is 4, 11, and 14. So notice that uh, Excel down here goes ahead and calculates the average, 9.66, right? And I put it right there, all right? What is this right here? Well, from X bar, uh, from the second population, this is a possible X bar, okay? And what is it? Well, one possible sample that we could have gotten is that we could have gotten the first three, right? And so notice what the average is, 31.667, you know, okay? And that's what that represents, all right? So this is one possibility for X bar one. This is one possibility for X bar two. You do the subtraction between the two, what do you get? You get a minus 22. So that is one possibility that you can get for X bar one minus X bar two. It's a lot of calculating, right? But that's what's going on here. So uh, what I did was is that I have to do that for every possible combination of X bar one and X bar two. So for instance, this just repeats the uh, the uh, first, you know, um, uh, see it, what you got to think of is that for every combination of X bar one, you got to look at every possibility that it could be combined with X bar two. And so uh, so what I did was is that for this number right here, all it is is it's the first two numbers and the fourth number. That's a possibility for x bar 2. So notice that the average turned out to be 32. And there you go. There's 32. Okay. And x bar 1 could be the first, uh, the first, po the you know, the, the mean from the first three people again. Okay. So this is a different uh, possibility for x bar 1 minus x bar 2. Okay. So I went through all of them, and so all possibilities. And so I want you to point out to you guys something here is that you might be asking, well, hold on, does an X bar one change? Yes, X bar one could change. So notice the next X bar that could possibly pop up is 12. And so what would that be? That would be one, two, and four. So notice here, the average would be 12, okay? And and so I went through every possible combination, okay? Did the subtraction between them, all of them, and that's this column right here. These are all the possibilities. So if you have a 
population of 10 things and you took a sample size of three, there's 120 possibilities there. So there's 120 different possibilities for X bar one and there's 120 possibilities for X bar two. That means there's 14,400 different possibilities for X bar one minus X bar two. It's the multiplication of those two things. And so I have all 14,400 of them in this column right here, quite a bit of them, okay? And then what I did was I took this data and I threw it into um, StackCrunch, okay? So I wanna point out a couple of things to you guys, all right? So the first thing I want to do is I want to make some graphs here. Let's make a graph of X uh, for the first population and the second population. So the first population is bell-shaped, okay? It's uh, centered at, looks like about 25, or actually I think it's 24, I think it is, all right? Here's the uh, second one. I think it's centered at 44, all right? But they're both bell-shaped, okay? They're both very much bell-shaped, all right? Well, let's go ahead and make a graph of a histogram. So if you took a bell-shaped curve, sampled from it, and then uh, took a sample from another bell-shaped curve, and you put together the sampling distribution of the difference between the two, guess what you're going to get? You're going to get a nice uh, bell-shaped curve out of the sampling distribution for X bar 1 minus X bar 2. So I'm going to put that into, my, um, uh, into the uh, histogram. Okay, and those are all 14,400 uh, X bar one minus X bar twos. So that is the sampling distribution of X bar one minus X bar two. So all the possibilities. So you can get something as extreme as something almost 50 apart. Okay, and then you can get something where uh, it's it's possible, not high, highly likely, but you could get something where um, that uh, uh, you go ahead and sampled and you actually got a mean, all right, from the first population greater than the second one, all right, for, for X bar one and X bar two. Not likely, but it could happen, okay? So notice that where is this guy centered at? Well, I want to just show you here. I wanna go ahead and bring up some summary stats for X1, X2, and then X bar one minus X bar two. So notice X, uh, the population mean for the first one is 24. The population mean for the second one is 44. So the difference between the two is what? A minus 20, right? And notice where all 14,400 X bar one minus X bar twos are centered at minus 20. It's centered at mu one minus mu two, okay? So what happens when you do a random sample, okay? You are going to get one of these X bar one minus X bar twos, okay? And where is it going to be very closely located around? The value of a minus 20, mu one minus mu two. Notice most of them are located in there, okay? So let's say that you get an X bar right here. Well, we're gonna go over a couple of standard errors this way. We're gonna go over a couple of standard errors that way and it's gonna capture a negative 20, most likely, okay? If we get an X bar one minus X bar two over here, well, fine. We go over a couple of standard errors this way, we go over a couple of standard errors that way, okay? And we've captured, again, negative 20 in the confidence interval, okay? And notice that, uh, uh, that most likely, once you create that confidence interval, you're probably the confidence interval is going to be what? Entirely negative, meaning uh, mu2 was greater than mu1, all right? Because you're most likely going to get something, you know, from here over to here, okay? And once you create the confidence interval, it's going to be entirely negative. Well, when will you not get a confidence interval that's entirely negative? Well, if you get something, unfortunately, around here, out in the tail, but is that gonna to happen too often? Nope. Okay, so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the sampling distribution of X bar one minus X bar two, taking all possibilities for X bar one and doing uh, comparing that to all possibilities for X bar two, okay? 
for every possible sample that you could possibly do, put them all into a histogram, okay? And there you go, all right? So that's what we're talking about here. All right, let's go back to the slides here. So a confidence interval for the comparison between two population means is the following. And again, this is for the independent samples case. We're doing the two sample t-test, all right? And here it is. This should make sense. And the reason why, and I gotta get my pen back out. This is the point estimate, all right? That's a good starting point. Remember I told you that's a good starting point, right? But then we have to make a confidence interval around it. And since we're working with mu's, you know, means, right? mean or means, we got to work with the T distribution, right? And then there's that standard error that I talked about before. So that is estimating how those X bar one minus X bar twos vary from one another. Okay, there's the, there's the st standard error, okay? So what is this? Let's make sure that we understand this. This is the sample standard deviation from the first group squared over the sample size of the first group plus the sample standard deviation from the second group squared over the sample size of the second group. So notice here, you don't even need to have the same sample sizes. They should be relatively close. They shouldn't be that far apart from one another. They should be relatively close, all right? But they don't have to be the same, all right? They don't have to be the same. Uh, again, critical value, right? Now, the degrees of freedom are going to be calculated using software. And you know why? Hang on to your hat for this one. Here's the degrees of freedom for the critical value. Ay vey. It's a nightmare to calculate that. Okay. I don't want to calculate it. You don't want to calculate it. We're not, I'm not going to make you calculate it. Okay. But that is truly the degrees of freedom for, for this, uh, the two sample t-test. Okay. Um, and, and, and so, and plus this is only an approximation, by the way, it's not even the exact number. It's only an approximation. Okay. And so we're not going to calculate this. This that would that would be ridiculous. Okay. So uh, th that's why we're going to use WebAssign or just computer output uh, to really to construct the confidence interval. Um, we should be able to calculate this standard error, and certainly we should be able to calculate this guy here. But to make you calculate that would be silly. Okay. And so somehow uh, I'll make sure that we use a computer output or the computer to uh, calculate this stuff. So when we do it for homework, uh, you'll never have to calculate that um, degrees of freedom nor if on an exam. Okay. Okay. So I want to remind you of something. This is I'm going to go quicker than I did before because all the same rules apply that applied back in uh, the last section with regards to interpreting a confidence interval. So if I subtracted estimates for two numbers, and I can tell you that the difference will be positive. So if I have two numbers, we'll call them A and B, and the difference is positive, all right? Uh, this indicates that the first number is greater than the second number, okay? And so if I went ahead and took two numbers, and I took the difference, all right? And I can tell you the difference is negative, less than zero, all right? That's indicating the first number is less than the second number. Same, so it's the same idea as we had before, right? And then again, uh, if I took the difference between two new numbers and it's zero, what is that telling us? Well, the first one is equal to the second number, okay? So uh, what we're doing here, in order to figure out if mu1 or mu2 is greater, what we're going to do is we're going to create a confidence interval for mu1 minus mu2 that contains only... Uh, Okay, what I'm saying here is that if we created a confidence interval for mu1 minus mu2 that contains only positive numbers, this suggests that mu1 minus mu2 is positive. And then we confer that mu1 is larger than mu2, okay? And so let's say that we uh, turned to the computer and the computer told us the confidence interval for two particular uh, mu1 minus mu2 happens to be four to seven, okay? So just like before, uh, we are not estimating mu1 nor mu2. So mu1 is not 4, mu2 is not 7. Okay, we're definitely not saying that. What we are saying is that mu1 minus mu2 is some sort of number, and that's the number that we are estimating. Okay, 
that's the number that we're saying is between four and seven. So if I subtracted estimates for two numbers and I can tell you that the difference will be positive, that means the first is larger than the second. Simple as that. And so this indicates that mu1 is greater than mu2 anywhere from four to seven units. Okay, so again, no difference. If we calculated a confidence interval for mu1 minus mu2 and the entire confidence interval turned out to be negative, we can infer that mu1 is smaller than mu2 then, all right? So we might run into something like that, okay? So the difference uh, of mu1 minus mu2, our estimate is somewhere between a negative nine to a negative three. So we're certainly not saying mu1 is a negative three. We're certainly not saying mu2 is a negative, uh, neg sorry. Uh, we're certainly not saying mu1 is a negative nine and mu2 is, is a negative three. We're not saying that at all, okay? We're saying that mu1 minus mu2 is some sort of number and we're estimating that number to be somewhere between a negative nine to a negative three. Okay. And so this would mean that the first is less than the second. Okay. So this is indicating that mu1 is less than mu2 anywhere from three to nine units, just like we did before. Okay. And again, if we have a confidence interval, and so we have a confidence interval that contains the value of zero. All right. So let's say the computer gave us a confidence interval of a negative four to six, okay? We're not saying that mu one is a negative four. We're not saying that mu two is six, okay? We're saying mu one minus mu two is uh, that is somewhere between a negative four and six, okay? Zero falls in the interview, in, interval. That means zero is a plausible value for mu one minus mu two, meaning it is a possibility, okay? Meaning mu one is equal to mu two, but it also, is indicating uh, uh, that uh, that that we just don't have a significant difference that we can tell between mu1 and mu2. Okay, there probably truly is a difference between mu1 and mu2, but based upon our samples, we can't tell which one is larger at this point. Okay, so mu1 could be greater than mu2, mu1 could be less than mu2, mu1 could be equal to mu2. All those are still plausible. It's as simple as that. And we don't know which one it is. We have inconclusive results. So hopefully you picked up on that uh, the last time that we talked about this stuff. So uh, cell phone use. All right, an experiment investigated whether, whether cell phone uh, use impairs driver's reaction times using students from the University of Utah. So this was an actual study that was done. So here's an experiment. We have 64 college students, 32 randomly assigned a cell phone uh, group, 32 to the control group. Okay, so uh, they were, they were listening to something like something on the radio, like like we would normally do. Okay, uh, listen to music on on a you know uh, through our cell phone or whatever. Okay. So students used a machine that simulated driving situations at irregular periods. Uh, target flashed red or green, and so the student couldn't uh, um, guess at it. Okay, so it was randomly done, if you will. Participants were instructed to press a break button as soon as possible when they detected a red light. The control group listened to radio or books on tape, whatever, uh, while they performed the simulated driving. The cell phone group carried out a phone conversation with someone in a separate room. Okay. So for each subject, the experiment analyzed their mean response time over all the trials. All right. So uh, like I said, Let's not try to calculate because of the ugly degrees of freedom. Let's just use some output. Now, I went ahead and used a uh, different program to do this because uh, you, let's face it, you're not always going to be using StatCrunch through the rest of your life and any time that you do statistics. Uh, and so let's just get used to seeing other types of programs, all right? And so uh, here we have our cell phone group. We have our control group. We have N1 being, so this is N1, 32, N2 is also 32. Be careful. What is this What is this guy right here, this 585.2? It's certainly not mu1, because the only way that you're going to know mu1 is that if you went ahead and, and uh, did this for everybody, okay? You didn't do that. So what is this? This is x bar 1. This is x bar 2. What is this guy over here, the standard deviation? Certainly this, not anything with sigma. Certainly not anything with the population, right? And so that's what these things are. Uh, all from sample stuff, 
because we don't know what mu1 is. We don't know what mu2 is. All right. All right. Uh, but we we're getting an idea based upon x bar 1 and x bar 2. So um, here it says estimate for difference. Uh, every program, every computer program that runs a two sample t test will give you this number, what this is. And it, they may not call it estimate for difference. Uh, they might call it something else. So like if we went and looked at stack crunch, it would call it something slightly different, but it's going to be pretty obvious that number is x bar 1 minus x bar 2. I guarantee you that's going to be somewhere in the computer pro computer output. Here's our 95% confidence confidence interval. And what is this? This is not mu1. That's not mu2. What is this for? Mu1 minus mu2. And notice it is entirely what? It's entirely positive, isn't it? Okay. Don't worry about this uh, yet. Uh, this right here, not needed. Not yet anyways. This not needed until we study some other stuff. Here is those ugly degrees of freedom. Turns out to be the degrees of freedom turn out to be 56. Okay. All right. So there was our confidence interval. And notice the confidence interval is entirely positive. That's telling us that mu1 is greater than mu2. So the interpretation, we are 95% confident that the mean response time for all cell phone users is greater than that for all non-cell phone users, anywhere from 12.24 to 90.8 seconds. Quite a bit of difference. Okay, this was a real study that was done. Okay, so we don't know exactly what mu1 minus mu2 is, but we do know this, that it's somewhere, we're pretty sure that it's somewhere within this range, okay, of 12.24 to 90.8, all right? But we are pretty sure that it is a, there is a difference between mu1 and mu2. And because the confidence interval turned out to be positive, that's telling us that mu1 was greater than mu2, all right? A little bit easier that since we don't have to do a whole bunch of calculating here, we can just kind of concentrate on the ideas here about the sampling distribution of x bar one minus x bar two, and then the output. All right, here's another example. Uh, an insurance company wants to know if the average speed at which men drive cars is different than that of women. All right, so notice that uh, the variable here is driving speeds, right? Last one was reaction time. They're both quantitative. So we're looking at means, not proportions. All right. So a random sample of 18 cars driven by women, population one on a highway, gave a mean speed of 68, standard deviation 2.5. Another random sample of 27 cars driven by men, population two, gave a mean of 72, standard deviation of 2.2 miles per hour. Construct a 95% confidence interval for the difference between the two population means. Now, uh, I have to put in here, is that assume that the speeds at which all men and women drive cars on this highway are both normal. I didn't talk about any conditions, but I'll have to talk about conditions in this one. All right. I just wanted to kind of, kind of go over uh, the basics and then we'll get into the conditions on this one. So what does this mean? X bar one is equal to 68. S one is 2.5. N one is 18. Okay. Sound good? How about the second sample, we got an X bar of 72, sample standard deviation, S2 of 2.2, and N2 is 27. All right, so what I did was, is that instead of doing mini tab, I did stack crunch, okay? I did stack crunch this time, and notice that stack crunch gives us slightly different uh, results here, okay? Um, but it's, it, you just got to know what you're looking at. That's, that's all. And, and, and you get used to it once you run these a couple of times. Sample difference. Well, remember I told you that every computer program is going to put this down. So what is this in this case? This is x bar 1 minus x bar 2. All right. There's your standard error. There's those ugly degrees of freedom. Uh, Minitab actually rounds it properly. Uh, what happens is that this should get rounded, okay? Uh, it gave the exact number, but what the computer is going to do when it actually calculates the confidence interval will round it properly to a whole number, okay? Here is the upper and lower limits of the confidence interval. Notice that the 
confidence interval is entirely what? It's entirely negative. It's entirely negative. All right. All right. So since the entire confidence interval is negative, we can infer that mu1 is less than mu2. So what's our interpretation? We are 95% confident that the mean speed all women drive, all women car drivers on this highway is less than that for all male males, anywhere from 2.52 to 5.48 miles per hour. So women drive a little bit slower, okay? And the difference between the two is somewhere between 2.52 and 5.48 miles per hour. All right. All right, let's run through the conditions to run uh, or to construct this confidence interval. And really all it is is an extension of a one sample case. And you'll see what I mean by that. So, you know, with the one, uh, just uh, looking at one population mean, you would need one random sample. Well, here we have two populations. And so you need two independent random samples. That's one, okay. And then either we need X1 to be normal or N1 to be greater than or equal to 30 for the cent for, and if that, if that's the case, then the central limit theorem applies. And we either need uh, x2 to be normal or n2 to be greater than or equal to 30. Okay, so you need uh, one of these, and you need one of these. All right, uh, you don't need them both to be uh, normal, and you don't need both of them to be uh, greater than or equal to 30 sample size. So you could have this one for the first one. And you can have this one for the second one. That's fine. All right. The reason why is because if you have either one of those, the sampling distribution of x bar one will be a t distribution. So if you have either one of these up here, okay, that tells us that the sampling distribution of x bar one will be approx will be approximately normal, a t distribution. And then if you have either one of these here, that means the sampling distribution of x bar two will be a uh, a t distribution, approximately normal distribution. And then if you do the subtraction between those two distributions, well, guess what? It's going to be a t distribution, all right? So if you went back to the problem that we just did, notice I had said that x1 and x2 were both normal. So we had these right here, okay? We had both of those right there, and we took some random samples, all right? We took random samples of the, of the drivers, okay, from both males and females, all right? Now, uh, the last thing is that, remember, these problems are assuming that either the population variances are not equal or you don't have any real advanced knowledge regarding the population variances, okay? So it's very rare, um, but there's a slightly different formula to calculate the confidence interval if we can, as can assume that the population variances are equal. Uh, and um, uh, and so we talked about that before, okay? And here, uh, and, and in the book, it's in the same section, they called it lesson two, okay? And so basically what's going on here is that the population variance for the first group is exactly the same as the second group, and as it is for if you put the two groups together into one population, that that uh, variance would be exactly the same as the first two groups, okay? but rarely do we know that these values, okay? But let's say that we did, okay? What we what would we do? Well, remember, this was a standard error if we had uh, uh, assumed unequal variances. This is what would change then, okay? What would change is that, uh, is the standard error, okay? And what would happen is that the standard error would turn into this, and we would what call, what we would call pooling the variance together, and we would pull the variances together, and uh, I didn't mean to make it at a heart. Um, we would pull the variances together into this uh, formula that I'm showing you here, and we would run the confidence interval that way. And so it's a slightly different way of looking at the standard error, okay? Um, but again, this is sort of a rare thing, okay? So I would rather just concentrate on the two sample t-test, the stuff that we went through today. Okay, thank you for your time.